بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى قيام يوم الدين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم the blessed month of Ramadan is marked by devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the need to be connected with Allah at a very deeper level. Now we may ask, well, why do we need this deep connection with God? The answer is very simple that otherwise our lives do not make much sense, do not have much meaning. But then the problem comes as to, well, what role does God play and why did he send us here in the first instance? It is here that we get quite baffled and we need to revert to the scriptures and try and make sense. The story that the scriptures give is that we have made a certain pact with God, that we will come to this world and that we will do righteous deeds in this world and that we will find our way back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that we are refined in our souls and in our minds. Now we have to trust what the scriptures are saying. Otherwise, there is no other alternative. We are left to ourselves. And when we look at this life and we say, well, I've just woken up and there's no meaning to it, that sits uncomfortably with us. And at an intuitive level, we know there is a purpose for us. We are meant to get somewhere. There is a deeper sense of existence. There is some noble end towards which we strive. So without God, life becomes meaningless. With God, life acquires a deep-seated meaning, provided we understand the relationship with God accurately not the one that God has created us one fine day and just sent us here and he wants to see if we do good or we do bad. In which case, the finger of blame will point at God that, oh God, you are reckless. You should not have created us in the first instance. And if you have created us in that way, then you should have already enlightened our heart as to who we are, what we are, what we are doing. So the only story that seems to be plausible is that we, as the scriptures say, we have made a pact. And in that pact, we have actually committed ourselves to come upon the face of this earth, to avail ourselves of the opportunity of life and get to know ourselves and arrive at the true meaning of what we are and who we are. And that is the journey of this life. And if that is the case, then the need for God at a deeper level within ourselves becomes indispensable. We cannot do without God. Now people might ask, well, why don't I remember this pact that I have made with God? The simple answer there is, well, the scriptures are informing you that you have made a pact with God. The past prophets are informing you that you have made a pact with God. Think about it clearly. Every scripture cannot be lying. Every prophet cannot be lying. There has to be some truth to it. Now, historically, you might have made a pact with God that you don't remember. On which day 
on which hour, in which condition, in which state. But the very fact that the heart yearns for meaning and says that there has to be more to it than what I understand, there is something deeper there that I need to unveil and arrive at, shows in itself that there is a yearning, that there is a purpose, that there is a goal. On the other hand, the whole issue of remembrance may be to do with our existential state, something intuitive within us, that remembrance at this instance is not only recollection by the mind of an event that has been forgotten, but it's a question of becoming mindful to something that is quite obvious. It is the story of when the Blessed Prophets went to their communities and especially the last prophet salamullah alayhi when he said to them do not kill your children do not be unjust transact righteously people said these are the very truths that we ought to be adhering to and that we had become mindless of he is reminding us of those salient truths that are with us in any case so at times, remembering and recollection means to become mindful. Now, if we look deep within ourselves, we will see that, yes, yes, there is more to it than what appears to me. And that this whole universe, this phenomenally huge, majestic universe, is alive to itself. There is something going on. There has to be a superior being whether the faithful call that superior being god and indeed he is god the needless beautiful author who is benevolent and who is merciful kind and who bestows but those people who do not or have not acquainted themselves with god might call it the cosmic consciousness or whatever else we might call him or call it or whatever designation we want to give it so here immediately we say, well, if there is a God, that God has to be needless because it stands to reason. If somebody can create clusters of galaxies and in each galaxy there are about a hundred million stars at the very least and each star has a certain amount of planets, you can imagine the creativity and the creative force of this beautiful being or the whole being in its entirety which then brings to mind, well, that being cannot be so petty as to be so consumed by me and the good and the evil that I am doing. That splendid being has to be concerned with me in a very parental way. And that being, whatever connection is required with him, is a connection for me to come to the fullness of my own existence. In this way, we can convince our rational minds that no, there is a higher purpose and I need to belong to that higher purpose in order to achieve it. Now the role that God plays here in this way is that he not only becomes that higher purpose but he becomes a means to that end as well. And this is what we find in the month of Ramadan. Be highly, highly connected with God so that your distractions are put to one side and you become focused and directed to the achievement of your purpose. For example, rather than continuing life in the way that we continue in search of sustenance or entertainment or whatever else we do to see that actually these are the bodily functions and with the preoccupation of these things I have not achieved anything substantive within myself. The connection with God is to awaken us to that deeper calling that is within us, but from which we are constantly distracted. And therefore, in this month, what is emphasized are Salah and Siyam or Zakat of the body. Now we ask, well, what is the purpose of this Salah and this Siyam? The answer is quite obvious that Salah means to be connected and the bodily gestures that are there are there to enforce upon the mind that we need to cut away from these distractions and to be focused with God 
and with ourselves in order to awaken ourselves and lead so that we can be led towards that purpose. The importance of Salah has been mentioned in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Isa that Isa said, Wausani bis salati was zakat, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained that I establish salah and the zakat. Of the previous prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wawhayna, and then we inspired them righteous deeds and establishment of prayers and the performance of zakat. If we look at it very carefully, this salah and zakat are actually means for us to revert to that question, that deeper yearning that there is more and that more is God himself and we need to attain him. So on the one hand, the salah as a physical form of bowing and prostrating is there to awaken the mind that we need to be cut off from these distractions of the world and find that deeper sense of purpose and existence. And then at a deeper level, the salah is supposed to direct us towards that end so that we may not become so overly preoccupied by life that is in any case moving on and we are being fed and night comes after day and the next day comes after night, whether we like it or not. These are to do with our bodies, but we cannot be preoccupied with these things. We need to become aligned that I am and I am living and there is a purpose to be attained. And at the finest level, Salah brings about this connection with God, the most beautiful one. This connection with God is for us to become like God, for us to be liberated as opposed to wasting time in entertainment, for us to inquire about the nature of existence, what is it all about, to see its meticulous workings, to see its interconnectedness, to see how beautifully everything is organized, to awaken that finer being, to appreciate what is going on. At a deeper level, to see ourselves above our desires and passions, to see ourselves beyond competition and hatred, to come into a substantive state of existence. Then beyond that, for us to be cut away from our own ego and arrogance for whose sake we perform our deeds and we lead our lives. Instead, to become as unlimited as God, as beautiful as God. This connection through Salah with Allah and through purification of the self, either by purification of the body through hunger or through purification of the heart by removal of immoral traits or unvirtuous state or the purification of the soul by removing the ego and the pursuit of our desires or doing even good deeds for our own sake and doing good deeds for the sake of the nobler cause. All of this, this is there in order to liberate us and with that liberation comes that sense of us attaining the real meaning of existence. I want to emphasize this point again, especially to the faithful, that these blessed prophets who went before, look at their characters. There is one who is flung into the fire and he embraces the fire for the sake of his conviction. Then there is another one who is faced with great floods, but he has this great conviction in God and he makes the ark despite the mockery that he faces. Then there is one who is faced with the roaring waves and chariots behind him, but he strikes at the sea and parts it in two. Then there is another one who is being taken to his crucifix. Look at these grand, grand, noble humans. They had utmost conviction in God. And look at their beings. They were godly humans. They were morally refined and they were virtuous being and beautifully aligned with God to the extent that we saw them a display of God's beauty. And we saw them as people illuminated in their beings. These are the people 
who said, be connected with God, the higher purpose. Perform the salah. Establish the purity, whether it's by fasting or giving away wealth or cleansing the soul and cleansing the mind and subduing the ego. Look at this noble human people. We have had great humanitarians in our history who have spent excessively to alleviate poverty. Look at these people. They weren't very rich. They were very, very poor people. Yet, they leave a decisive mark on the course that humanity has taken after they've left them. They have shaped the human history. What did they have? They were covered in rags. They were poor people to the society. Yet, there was nothing but wisdom in them, enlightenment in them. You can see that they have attained their purpose. When you look at the great Moses, salamu alayhi, you say, wow, what a phenomenal person. You look at Isa, your heart melts away in love to this, with, in front of the Spirit of God. You look at the blessed Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you say, how can it be possible that whilst being within a human, constraints of being a human, can a person be so impeccable in the way that they are, in their God-centricity, in their righteousness, in their truthfulness. And then you look at these three people and their father, the great Abraham, and his blessed father, Nabi Nu, and his blessed father, Nabi Ibrahim. What of the world did they have? What power, worldly power, did they wield? They came and they spoke to minds. They spoke to hearts. They enlightened people. They gave them a sense of purpose. They liberated them all. These were the people who were connected with God and were extremely God-centric. They said two things. You have made a pledge with God. This world is an opportunity for you. You need to be connected with God. And all of them, they said, this connection is a form of salah, whether the Jewish salah, Christian salah, Hindu salah, Buddhist salah, Muslim salah. There is a salah, a form that is befitting the body. Through this salah, connection of the body, will the connection of the mind open. And by the opening of the connection of the mind, the connection of the soul towards Allah will open. They all emphasize the necessity of purity. The purity of the body will lead to the purity of the mind, will lead to the purity of the soul. They also reminded that you as an individual are not alone on this earth. You as a collective body have made a pact. Not only you as an individual, but you as a human community need to get it right. I'll leave us with that beautiful example from the Blessed Prophet in which the Blessed Prophet said, that the community has to be a virtuous community. So somebody went to him and he said, Oh messenger, isn't it enough that I am a good individual at the exclusion of my community? The Blessed Prophet responded. He said, and of course I'm paraphrasing and taking it differently. He said, if we are up, uh, on board a ship and all of us has our own, have our own designated place, if one person begins to make a hole on the seat where he's beneath the seat where he sits what will happen the person said the hole of the boat will sink and everybody will die he said this is the nature between the this is the nature of the relationship between the individual and the community at large all of us have to be aligned with god eventually strive towards that purify yourself and let that purity spread to the fellow human beings. With that, let us pray Surah Fatiha for all those poor souls who have gone before us and those who are unwell for their quick recovery and for us, for Allah to keep us all safe. Al-Fatiha. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وآله الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In line with the first khutbah As a faithful community we need to step back and look at the way we are introducing God in the minds of our children as parents and as educators within the madrasa system. Our children are educated in do's and don'ts. You need to do this, you need to pray, you need to fast. But never do we take the time to explain to the children about God and God and human relationship. We tell children that they have to do certain things, otherwise there will be problems for them, as opposed to saying, no, that even when you can't talk with me, you can talk with God. As opposed to introducing God as a parental figure and as a friend within their lives, we impose God as a master, as a creator. And this is what brings about that confusion in their tender minds and that confusion is carried with them into their adulthood and soon they become disenchanted with God or they lose confidence with God because they feel they are duty bound. And then when they awaken to a broader truth, they say, well, why should God be so petty? Why should he need my prayers? Why should he need these bowing and these prostrations five times a day? I mean, doesn't he have anything better to do? Does he need to establish his authority by seeing me bowing and prostrating? That is not the way to introduce God to children. That is not the way we should be with God. The fact that we are so messed up shows that we haven't had a good upbringing from our parents uh, without blaming them. And we were all naive. And from the early edu mother's education system. The fact that we have no confidence with our God. The fact that God does not make any sense to us. The fact that there is no real sense of life and purpose. The only purpose is pray and fast and I'll give you paradise. Don't pray and fast and I'll put you into hell. God is a liberating force. God is the means for us to acquire meaning. Someone with whom we can relate. Someone who understands us when nobody else understands us. Somebody who accepts us in the ugliness that we find ourselves, in the despicable way when we find, in, in, in which we find ourselves. Somebody who encourages us to love ourselves and not loathe ourselves when the whole of the world despises us. God has to be introduced in the most beautiful way. We need to tell our children, God does not need prayers. God does not need fasts. The fasts are there to purify our bodies. And when our bodies are purified, the mind becomes purified because as mind and body are inextricably connected, if the body is unhealthy, the mind becomes unhealthy. If the body becomes healthy, the mind becomes healthy. To say to the children that this prayer that we pray is not because God needs it or because it's obligatory in that way. How can you make devotions obligatory? How can you make love obligatory? It's not obligatory. You only say it's obligatory in order to accustom people to praying it so that they might awaken to the finer side of God. Yes, it is obligatory for our consumption. For now, don't get me wrong. But that's not the way to teach the children. To say to the children, no. As you have a need to be with a friend, as you have a need to come to the parent and seek comfort through the lap of the parent and the embrace of the parent, as you need to know that there is a protector for you, your parent, as you need to know that there is a helper for you in your sibling, as you need to know that there is an un non judgmental friend that you can talk with, that is your need to connect with God. Pray to Him and then speak to God. Share with God all those things that are deep within you that you feel embarrassed to share with anybody else. Share with your God. Become a friend of God. We need to tell our children that, look, I'm only your parent. 
beyond a parent is a parent. I am only a friend. Beyond the friend is the real friend and the real parent. You need to establish your connection with him. I am only accompanying you till my body allows me to accompany you. Once the body gives up, I am no longer here with you as your parent or your friend. But the parent of all parent, the friend of all friend, will never leave your side. Even after I have gone, he will be with you. Even when you are lowered into your grave, that friend will be with you. Recognize that friend. Fall in love with that friend. Form an attachment with that parent. Rely on that parent. He is there for you. I am a mere introduction into the real thing. If we can introduce the love and belonging to God, then these souls will become virtuous souls. They will be liberated intellectually. They will no longer be frightened to ask questions. No longer will they die without their potential being realized. Their full human godly potential will be actualized by the time they die. Life will become a phenomenal opportunity. Of course, we need to talk at length about challenges of life and sufferings. And inshallah, if Allah so wills, we will do that at some later date. I leave us with this reminder that it is the month of Ramadan. Our neighbors are our family. The people in dire need are our family. The people in our locality are our family. The people abroad are our family. Allah expects us to care for our family, give excessively, whether it is care through personal service or through giving of God's bounties. Give excessively. It's an opportunity. We should not see it as duty to Allah that is being performed or a favor done to others but we should see it as Oh Allah, you have given me this opportunity to attain you. Give excessively and humbly thank Allah for giving the good sense of giving. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin اللهم صل وسلم على محمد المصطفى وعلى علي المرتضى وعلى فاطمة الزهراء وعلى الحسن المجتبى والحسين الشهيد بكربلاء وعلى علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي 